Hello, everybody, and welcome to the world's favorite youth baseball podcast, Clearing the Bases, featuring coach Jimmy Filangieri. I'm David Friedman, and I want to thank you for coming along this ride with us. How are we doing today, coach? Doing good, Dave. It's playoff time in baseball almost. You know, things are uh, happening. Yeah, it's an exciting time for the uh, for us from the professional standpoint. We've got your Yankees have locked up their spot pretty well, and uh, my Phillies are hanging on by their fingernails, man. It's day by day for us. Yeah, but at least right now it's exciting for you, okay? You got all this going on, and you, you hang, like you said, you know, hanging on. Uh, for me, right now I'm bored until – what is it Thursday, Friday of next week? <laughs> yeah, man, it's, it's, it's coming up fast. I I'd like to be a little more bored to be honest with you. Then, uh, you know, <laughs> my team losing uh, seven out of the last 10 it's, 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 there's nothing worse than a late season collapse. I mean, that's yes. from a, from a fan standpoint, that's just watching. We had a, a two game lead in the wild card and now we're basically at a, even heat. I think right now we're a half game ahead only because we've played one more game. So, uh, so it's, it's at a dead heat with the brewers. So, um, well, I guess on the upside, it gives me something else to be interested in. I'm interested in brewers games for the first time in my life. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess that would be something that I would never think of. Right. All right. So, so what's, uh, what else is going on? What are you doing with all your free time? Well, actually I've been paying attention to the Yankees. So what, what I want to know from you is, we know that Judge just hit number 61 to tie Roger Maris. So if he hits 62, which I believe he will between now and Wednesday, who's the all-time home run leader? Is it him or is it Bonds? So, uh, okay. My my short answer, which I never give, is I'll, I'll, I would still say Bonds. Uh, and I know that's not popular, certainly here in New York, certainly not. Uh, between 50% of the members of the show, uh, probably not, not, not a, uh, a, a positive answer, but um, yeah, I, I, I just look at it of, we have to, we have to judge what, no pun intended, what was, what's been done in the time that it was done. So, you know, is he a cheater? Yes. What percentage of the, players were cheaters including the pitchers um back during that time i mean we we don't really know but we can assume a lot yeah right so to me and and also i guess i'll just preface with that's not something that i get really wrapped up in and that that surprises a lot of people i talk to knowing how into baseball i am I, I just don't get that wrapped up in the a it's a, it's a Yankee. And obviously having been a lifelong non Yankee fan living in New York, God damn, have I had enough of the Yankees, uh, and, and all, their, <laughs> all their accolades. Uh, so, but it's also, I don't know. I, I just, I just don't get too wrapped up on it. The whole asterisk thing for, for bonds. I mean, there was, there was an asterisk for Maris. So I, I don't know. Right. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I I'm I'm pretty much the same way. I usually don't get wrapped up in those stats and stuff like that, but I figured it was uh it was a controversial controversial. I can't even say that. Okay. Thanks, Porky Pig. Um you gotta, you gotta figure I, I figure that it's something that people are talking about, so I figured I'd bring it up and just to make conversation. Yeah, yeah I mean obviously you're you're on the other side of the fence on that, right? Um, yes, I mean, I, I, yes, I, I, I look at it that he hit it without any enhancement, we'll say. But again, to your point, the other guys did it in an era where probably everybody was doing the same thing they were doing. So, you know, I don't know. It, it, in my mind, it's, it's, it's still a debate, I'll say. But being a Yankee fan, I got to <laughs> say that to me, that's the record. Right. All right. Well, it's got the most home runs as a Yankee. Yeah, so you know, go ahead and and take that. I know it's the whole American League, but yeah, it's it's interesting. I, you know, it can be an interesting topic. It's just not one that, again, it, it doesn't really excite me. And you go back through the history of time, and there was always cheating scandals. And in the seventies and eighties, guys were taken in or early eighties. They were loading up on amphetamines and speed, right. and and how much was that enhancing things? 
So, I, you know, I, I don't know. I, I just, uh, it's, it's, it's getting nitpicky and I can still just appreciate the, the acts as they were done. Plus yeah. not trying to paint a negative picture of it at all. I, I think it's, if he does break it, even tying it, you know, you're getting enjoyment out of it. Great. Good, you know, good on you. And, and, and I'm happy for you. Um, but who knows what we're going to find out in a couple of years that anybody in this era was doing, you know, yeah. stealing, stealing signs. Cause if you know, it's a fastball coming, obviously that's going to increase when you're, you know, you're a monstrous guy like judge, especially when, when you're strong, that knowing what pitch is coming in that much. So, and I'm not suggesting that that's what's going on, but we just, we don't know. We don't so know. I, so I guess we could say that there'll be a forever debate on this. If he does, you know, because I, I'm figuring that they have, I believe it's five, they have six games left. I believe it is. He could hit three, four more home runs and get to sure. 66 it's, or 65. especially if, if I don't know their, their schedule, if they're playing teams that are either not playing for, a playoff spot and have already clinched and, and their seating is all set, then those pitchers are going to be more likely to throw to them because the games quote unquote, don't really matter right. at this point. So, so maybe he gets a few more, although nobody wants to be, nobody wants to be the pitcher that gave up the 62nd home right. run either. Right. So right. think about it. If you were on the mound, eh, I might lose a little control during this at bat, you know, <laughs> Um, uh, you know, I, I don't want to go down in record books as that guy. Although I don't know. Then again, if I'm, if I'm a mediocre player, maybe I do, maybe at least people will remember me for something. I get, you know, there's all different things that could go on in a player's mind. Yeah. I think it was one of the blue Jays pitchers who said he doesn't want to wind up being the answer to a trivia question. <laughs> right. 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 So, um, so yeah, so we'll see, but I, I, yeah, I would, I would be, I don't see any reason why he wouldn't, if he can get another, He's going to get another 15 to 20 at bats. Certainly why, you know, if he doesn't, it would be real disappointing at this point. Sure. Imagine that oh. it's 60 home runs and you're a disappointment. <laughs> how, sp <laughs> how spoiled, how spoiled are we? Yeah, exactly. So we have a very special guest on our show today. Her name is Linda Flanagan. She is a published author. She's had multiple books published. Uh, she was a founding member of the New York chapter of the PCA, the Positive Coaching Alliance. Sounds like something that you and I are somewhat interested in here. And we talk about it a little bit. Uh, she has a new book. Yeah, she has a new book that just came out in August called Take Back the Game. And the tagline on it is how money and mania are ruining kids sports and why it matters. And again, sounds like this is right up our alley. Yeah, it came through on on one of the news feeds that I follow about her book coming out. So her book, you know, just came out recently. And I did a little bit of research and found out what it was about. And I said, geez, I said, you know, she seems like she'd be a great guest to to come on and, and talk about her book. And I reached out to her and she was gracious enough to agree to come on. And I think this is going to be a really good conversation. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to speaking with her. Uh, very, very interesting person with her background and uh, the topics that she talks about in her book. So without further ado, let's get into the show with Linda. So welcome, Linda. Thank you for joining us today on the show. Thanks for having me. Happy to be here. Great. Now, so we talked a little bit, introduced you to our audience, but I'll let you go ahead. Uh, how do you introduce yourself to, to people in terms of what you're doing today? Because you have a, quite the varied background. Oh, yes. Well, I would say... I'm the author of a new book, Take Back the Game, How Money and Mania Are Ruining Kids' Sports and Why It Matters. I'm a former coach, uh, fairly recently retired, actually just at the perfect time. I finished coaching after the fall of 2019 before all hell broke loose. Oh, oh nice. Good timing. That was great yeah. to plan that out that way. Uh, yeah, it was purely <laughs> purely by design. And, um, and I'm also a runner and a mother and all those other outside things. All right, great. So the, the new book, it just came out uh, middle of August or so, uh, beginning of August. So take back the game. Let's, let's dive right into that because it's something that we talk about pretty much every show here, at least some of the topics. But for Jimmy and I, it's more of just what we see and what, what we're hearing from our own teams that we're coaching and what we see around on the ball fields. But let's, let's talk a little bit about what, what prompted you to want to 
put this together in a book? Well, I've been a longtime athlete my whole, you know, my whole life. I played as a young person and I you know, grew up with sports and I'm still a um, participant. I'm still a runner. So they've been a big part of my life. And, you know, when I had kids, then I naturally, my husband and I both wanted our kids to play. And um, almost immediately what I saw, what we both saw was this kind of um, over-involvement um, that was troublesome. And when my youngest was in kindergarten, that's when I started coaching. And I saw it then from the coach's perspective, which is probably more upsetting because you're on the receiving end of a lot of the, the craziness. And so being wearing all these, these different hats, I suppose the mother of an athlete, a coach and an athlete myself. And then I'm also a journalist in my, in my other life. So I started poking around and doing some research on what I was seeing. And it really substantiated my gut feelings about what was happening, which, you know, you guys know about, which is the over-involvement, the, the obsession with college and what sports can do for you extrinsically rather than what they do for you as a person and how they help you grow. Um, so all that was substantiated by the research and then it kind of turned into a book. So it, 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 correct me if I'm wrong, but from, from my point of view, being involved in this for almost 20 years, it seems like what's happening is, is and to your point about, about the, the goal of getting to college and all, all of these other motives, the, the, the goal of just having fun seems mm -hmm. to be taken out of sports almost completely. Yeah. Yeah. Well, at young ages, I mean, it's it's really striking when you when you go to you can just wander around town if you happen to live in a community where there are parks and fields and just seeing all the kids in their uniforms. I, I think that's also what it's so striking. Like, what are they doing in uniforms? Like, they should be just playing, you know, like having fun. And that's been stripped away as we've made it so serious and adult centric. It's adult centric. And then I think also at at older, at, you know, as kids develop and become competitive in high school, and that's where it may not be the focus doesn't necessarily, it's not only fun. I really think with kids, it should be about fun. But in high school, maybe it gets more serious where their kids want to develop and become really good athletes. Even that's been warped as well, because it's less about what the, the teenagers want and more about what the adults want. And that's also destructive and corrosive to, to development. Yeah, I've, I've had many conversations and the one, the one that comes to mind most is my, believe it or not, with my sister, where once my nephew was, he's in, um, he's in college now, but I believe this was last year during his senior year, my sister seemed to be so upset that he didn't want to play baseball in college. Mm -hmm. And I actually had to sit her down and ex explain to her that it's about him. It's <laughs> not about what you want. It's what yeah. he wants. <laughs> yeah, I know that that's, it's so strange how that's shifted, you know, that it's more about what we, we parents want for our kids than what they want for themselves, or at least that's the way we think about it. And, you know, I've heard so many parents, you know, not long ago, a woman saying, um, how devastated she's going to be when her son goes to college because she won't get to see him play, you know, and, and I, it is fun to watch your kids play. Like I get that it's exciting and it makes you feel great when they do well. It's like, okay, but it's not our thing. We should have our own things to do rather than just, you know, be on the sidelines. Right. It, it, it shouldn't be, it shouldn't be devastating at that point. It's, in her life. It, <laughs> it's 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 upset. It's somewhat upsetting. You're going to miss it, what have yeah. you. But that that seems a little extreme, which yeah. goes along with the whole topic, right? Because it, it's it's so much about what we parents satisfying our own kind of need to feel important and relevant. You know, when you have an athletic kid, and this was something I found so really interesting in my book was like, how did we get here with this change in parents' views of sports and our kids and 
you know, I know when I was growing up and it sounds so trite to say it, but you know, like my parents, they, they were all for sports and participation and play, but he was supposed to be a part of life, part of your life. And it wasn't their thing, God forbid. I mean, they were doing their own stuff. They were busy, you know, I mean, they have five kids and it just like the idea that they would drive around all weekend. There's no way in hell that would have happened, you know, yeah. and it's not because they didn't love me and my siblings. It was just a different expressed differently. But now for a variety of reasons that, you know, are hard to understand. Kids have become like the focal point, the centerpiece. And then through athletics, you know, there's, we all know athletes are so celebrated. This is what better way to uh, establish yourself as a wonderful parent, a qualified, you know, moral parent than to spend a fortune on your kids' sports. You know? <laughs> That's That's, I mean, what you, it, there's so much truth to what you just said. I, when I was growing up, occasionally my mother would come to a basketball game. My father my, I don't think my father ever saw me play either basketball or baseball. Mm -hmm. Never. He was never there, never involved. And I, I could just imagine if I went home to him with something that happens nowadays. Uh, hey, dad, coach is not playing me at shortstop. He's playing me at second base. My father would look at me and say, get out of here. Go find something to do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. It's like, what are you coming to me with that for? What do you want me to do about it? You know, right. it's like, me it's your thing. Right. Meanwhile, nowadays, the, the parent would be like, well, I'm going to go talk to that coach and we're going to get you a short. Yeah, I mean, it's gone nuts. I know. Yeah. Well, and other, I, oh, go ahead. I was just going to say the other aspect of it. Imagine, Jimmy, if you came home and said, oh, dad, uh, can you cut me a check for four grand? Because I'm going to play. I'm going to play on this travel team for four months. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Sure. Here. Here. Yeah, yeah sure. Go, thing. Go take this. Yeah, I could well, I could see if I if I even asked him for fifty dollars to play what his reaction would have been. Well, it's so crazy, and you know I guess the other thing I've often thought about with um, parental inter involvement with coaches and inter as a coach it feels like interference. You know, is that if you look at what's going on, you know, broadly with sports, youth sports, collegiate sports, where there's abuse of athletes by coaches or you know team doctors what's so striking to me is that it's we forgiven parents don't step up and inner and protest when there's something abusive going on and they of course they don't see it or define it as abusive you know the screaming the you know the physical corrections and that's just part of like becoming a team player and getting tough and having developing discipline. But that's when, in my view, the time to inter to get involved as a parent is when there's bad stuff going on. When the coach, when you know, the coach is berating kids, humiliating them, punishing them for making mistakes. Like that's when they should be involved. It's when, you know, the child's playing time isn't you know, satisfactory to the parent or the position is wrong or they don't start or they're pushed to JV. That's when the kid needs to figure it out. But so they're just getting involved at the wrong times, but they, they do have a role. I think there's should be paying attention, but it's not, they're paying attention to the wrong thing, I guess is what I would say. Right. They're, they're getting involved for the wrong reasons at the wrong time. Exactly. Yeah. But there yeah, are times to be involved. I mean, there are. Because sure. bad things do happen with coaches. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you read about them in the paper and online constantly about coaches that have done the wrong thing and uh, makes me cringe whenever I read it. Yeah. Yeah. And it seems like the, the pendulum, say, I do feel like the pendulum swung very fast on that, where it went from parents were afraid to say something to the coach and that there'd be retaliation on the kid in terms yeah. of, all right, well, you know, then I'm just not going to play a kid, blah, 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 to where now all of a sudden it's the, like we said before, the slightest bit of uh, slight to, to somebody's child in terms of he's not playing the right position or he yeah. only played 
five out of the seven innings last game instead of the whole game or, or whatever. Like, so, and, and so, you know, we went from not saying anything about things that were clearly wrong. Yes. So now where we say anything we want about things that are just part of life. Yes. Right. 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 And, well, and if we, if we don't like it, we'll just get rid of the coach. Yeah. Right. That's the other thing. Well, I remember a parent at one of the schools I coached at, she would march into the athletic director's office and with you know, her little notepad saying that reported how many minutes her child had played in the basketball team. Oh my she God. Being there with a stopwatch and say, well, she, you know, if she were in for the full 30 minutes, our team would have won. And, you know, I mean, that kind of stuff is insane, you know, like right. she's, she's <laughs> clearly not enjoying watching her kid play period because she's too worried about the stats. Yes. Exactly. And that's where, again, you know, balance out being a parent and being yeah. the coach from the sideline, from the stands type of thing. And that's, yeah, that's not. Well, you know, one thing that we, I haven't talked about on any of the podcasts, and I, I don't even think it made it into my book, but I think is really um, kind of relevant for this conversation is the role of the status of coaches. You know, I talk about parents and their concern about status because I do think that drives a lot of the misbehavior. But I, I also think we we coaches, one of the really tricky things to figure out is your own status because we have this weird kind of bifurcation. On the one hand, we're, um, we have a lot of control over kids. They're, you know, the critical playing time and that sort of thing about we sometimes have relationships with college coaches. We have some important status in parents' minds for those reasons. On the other hand, we're also like the lowly coaches, uh, you know, the dumb coaches who don't know anything, you know, who can be, you, you quickly catapult over them when, and go to the athletic director when there's a problem and get the coach fired. There's this kind of weird limbo we're sort of in as coaches that is, um, I don't know. I've never heard that really talked about where, and I don't mean like the super, the college coaches paid millions of dollars, but just normal everyday coaches who have this weird kind of role in parents' eyes. Right. I can, I, I identify perfectly with what you're saying. I don't know. Jimmy's experience may be a little different at where we are. Our, our, the head coach of our high school, the varsity coach has been there 30 years, grew up in the town, played at this school. It's just like a yeah. stereotypical small town type yes. of thing. It, and we'll see in a couple of years, because obviously the, as the, these kids get older, we'll see if this, uh, if, if this is just a, the new wave that's coming in. But we have dealt with, and I've only been there two years. The guy that's my, my head coach of my JV team has been there five, but one of them was the COVID year. So I don't know, you know, yeah. throw that out. But he definitely gets way more, parent involvement than the varsity coach does and i think that there's i think a big part and, and believe me and, and he is the fairest coach i've i've ever worked around mm -hmm. so i think a lot of that is just he's just the jv coach yeah you know like yeah. i don't think the varsity coach is seeing it. even that difference mm -hmm. yes. seems to be tangible yes right. oh because right. the varsity coach has the relationships with the college coaches and you know can write the letter of recommendation you know, so right. there's maybe a little more like, oh, we have to be a little more careful with that person. So, Dave, you, you were saying mm -hmm. that <clears throat> that you think that Brian gets most of the heat because they they don't have that same level of respect. I just want to make sure I'm understanding. Yeah. That. Yeah. I mean, that's again, I, I can't say for sure. And like I said, we'll see over the right. next couple of years. But Linda, just a little more background real quick. Our kids are better kids mm -hmm. as ninth graders are already getting pulled up to varsity because just wow. because of the number. So we, we really, a lot of our kids, we only see one year, the absolute max would be two. We, we had one 10th grader on our team last year on our okay. JV team. That was wow. it. So, yeah, so we're totally different situations. So for us, it really, and it did seem, and, and it's not that the parents were, I wouldn't say they were over the top ridiculous in terms of their, their lack of respect, but they definitely felt like they could come in. It was easier for them to come and talk to Mm -hmm. talk to or talk at yeah. us at our level than going up to the varsity coach like yeah. I said, we'll see in another year or two because this stuff gets yes. seems to be getting worse obviously yeah right so let's let's move back in in a little bit into the direction of, of travel sports 
one of the big problems, and we kind of touched on it a little bit, is travel sports have become a situation where if you have a lot of money, then you're going to be participating greatly in it. And if you don't have a lot of money, well, then you're kind of kicked to the curb. Right. So what, do you, what, what are your thoughts on that? Because to me, that seems like a really big problem. Well, it's huge. I mean, I, I think the youth sports environment is like it's, it's, it's feast or famine. You know, it, all the money that has, you know, sluiced through sports has had this effect of in it's unhealthy in both ways, in my view, depriving, you know, low income families and low income kids from participating. It's, it's the it's the it's all the money and the cost combined with the, you know, um, withholding of public funds for parks and that sort of thing that. So there's just not this the opportunity, as we know, in low income areas. And then on the other hand, you have this crazy spending and, you know, more is better. It's always more, more teams, more sessions, more coaches, more, more, more. And then that, of course, has a, this feasting has an opposite set of problems where we have all the overuse injuries and the disruption of families and just an insane concentration on sports and winning and not development and not healthy development. I mean, I'm sure this is everything you talk about, but it's this, you know, two tiered problem on the one there's not enough on the other. There's too much. Yeah. As a matter of fact, on our, on our last show, Dave and I spoke about this, that I'm actually, I I've taken a step away from travel baseball. And I would say that the biggest reason that I did that was because of that situation where I see, or I should say that this year opened my eyes more so to the fact that people are paying crazy amount of money, mm -hmm. regardless of the kid's ability. And I, I don't even know if the kid's ability should warrant spending that kind of money. But when you have kids that, in my opinion, as a coach, are recreational players, possibly high school players, but really nothing beyond. Mm -hmm. I believe that a lot of times that people that have money believe if I spend all of this crazy amount of money on this kid, that maybe he's going to be able to go and play college baseball. And boy, I don't think that's the truth. Yeah, well, that's a song and dance. I mean, that is being sold to so many parents that, you know, if you just, you know, you just pay a little more, you know, you join this you try to get your child on a better club team that it's going to translate into some future, you know, future success, future college scholarship or recruitment or, you know, and that's a whole other issue, whether that's even a good thing. But, um, you know, I think one of the most important pieces of information and you guys, if you, do you follow the um, families and sport lab at Utah state, it's run by Travis Dorsch. And he does all this research on these, these issues and, you know, about how youth sports spending and um, just the level of involvement, how it affects kids and families. And he found, his lab found that the more parents spend, the less kids enjoy it and the more pressure they feel. And to Makes me, sense. that's like the bottom line, like, okay, so back off, back off. Yeah. Don't waste your money. Like, let them figure it out. Maybe do one club if if they're so gung ho on their sport and good for them. Have them do one team, you know, pay in one way, but you don't have to do all the nonsense that's being thrown at parents. And I think it's really hard if you have money to say that's not necessary. You know? Yeah, definitely. I mean, it, it's something again we've we've talked about plenty of times on here where there's. You know, different obviously differing philosophies about the whole the whole the purpose of travel ball and mm -hmm. and where it's at and and to me i know how it how it started for me as a player 40 years ago was just hey here's a chance to play some extra games and mm -hmm. i'm like great i i love baseball mm -hmm. so but that's been so perverted through the years where it's just about bringing home the trinkets and you know, putting something, the, the trophies or medals or whatever they get 
uh, from the facilities standpoint, it's about putting the, the championship trophies in the window to get more clients in the door so they can yeah. charge more and, and have more private lessons or, or whatever. And so much of that, I mean, there, there is something to be said for obviously the better that you are at something, probably the more you're going to enjoy it. Mm -hmm. But then there's that balance, like in all areas of life that we have to try to find. Right. Well, the, and if it's the, the no, no, sorry. I'm sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. Well, no, I mean, I think it, again, it goes back to who is this for, you know, who are the sports for? Like Jimmy, your father was like, you know, came to some of your games or whatever, but it was to say it wasn't a priority is an understatement. It sounds like it was your thing. And as the more the parents invest in it and expect some kind of return, I mean, the kids pick up on that. And that takes away from the intrinsic motivation to play and the love of play for its own sake. You know, I, I had a conversation with one of the assistant coaches at the high school where I, where I coach. And we had this conversation about evaluating talent. And the worst evaluator of talent is a player's parent. There is yeah. no way a parent can evaluate the talent of their own child. It just, it's impossible. Yeah. And I think that that's where a lot of the problem comes in because the parent looks at him and sees that maybe he's on, the player is on, let's say a mediocre travel team and the kid is doing well. Mm -hmm. In the parent's mind, that kid is fantastic because he's on that team. Mm -hmm. However, that team may be a low level travel team and mm -hmm. if you take that same kid and put him up against a high level travel team, well, he's not going to be, they don't, they can't see that they have mm -hmm. blinders on. Yeah. So I think that's, that, that's another driving force in this whole culture that's been created. Yeah, no. And they're also being encouraged by some who may not have the best motives to like, keep at it. You know, he's doing great. She's doing great. She's going to on this path, we're going to get there. And then often doesn't amount to anything. Right. You know? Right. And I mean, really what you just said. Yeah. I mean, I would say most of the time it, it doesn't wind up being anything. Right. Most of the time it's, it's the few times where it does become something. Yes. Right. And you don't want, I think that the hard part as, as a coach, I mean, I, you don't want to like crush anyone's dream or make them think, oh, you're, you know, you're not that great. You don't want to like be the one to do that. No. And you want to encourage hope and um, hard work and like keep trying to improve and get better. But I guess when it feels like the only way you measure success is then whether or not you're recruited or something, that's when it's yeah. a bummer. <laughs> Right. If if the only personal enjoyment you can get out of doing the activity is the results and not the journey, yes. then that's where it's it's turned into you're you're making you're making it a business for the kid. Yeah. And that's just that 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 can't be healthy. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And and also also to your point about what is that level that you're trying to achieve and and like you said, crushing kids' dreams. No, as coaches, obviously we don't want to do that. So I want you to be the best that you can be to be the mm -hmm. best at the level you can achieve. Mm -hmm. And now that that level may be JV baseball and mm -hmm. other kids it may be division one college baseball. Mm -hmm. right. So the idea is to, yes, don't crush their dreams, but be realistic and tell them to reach for what they can get to. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and I think when you're the parent and you get any kind of pushback like that, they can view it as, you don't have faith in my child or, you know, you're not, you're, you're discouraging them. And that's really not it. It's about realism. Yeah. And, and set, I mean, it's, it's one of the first things you hear about, whether it be in, in business or whatever is, is just setting realistic expectations, setting realistic goals. If my mm -hmm. goal is to start working out and put on a hundred pounds of muscle, I'm never going to hit that point. Yeah. That's not what my body frame will allow. But so, you know, set your setting your goals. Mind. And, and so on that note, I wanted to get into so Jimmy and I do fall into a bit of a trap sometimes of talking about the bad. And then it's all right, let's come up with some solutions. OK, mm -hmm. so so how do we how do we 
get out of this because it, it is a kind of a vicious circle of, well, you want your kid to be better. How do you get your kid to be better? You get your kid to be better by having them play more and paying for more uh, practices and, and private lessons and all that stuff. And then, yeah, they're going to get a little better, but then now they're too good for their team. And, and now that now you're going and paying more money to be on a different team and whatever. Mm-hmm, so mm-hmm. how do we, how do we break the cycle? Well, you know, I think I wish that there were some simple answer, you know, like we all want to say, oh, it's this, this is the answer. But, you know, I, I think it, it has to start with parents because, and the adults in general, because we adults are the ones who got us into this mess. Sure. You know, I, I think a lot would be improved if, if parents could step back and, you know, not feel the need to get in there and you know, this, it's driven by anxiety. I'm sympathetic to what drives this because it is not, it is hard to be a parent and you get so many mixed messages and everyone in your neighborhood is doing this crazy stuff. So who are we to say, you know, no, Sally doesn't need third grade travel soccer. You know, who are we to say? Everyone else is doing it. Right. You don't, you don't want Sally to fall behind because she's not doing that. And now she she's going to go from being, maybe she was in the top five on her team and now she's going to be not because she's not doing this extra stuff. Right. Or, or like you said earlier, even diversifying to get into getting into softball or getting into track or getting, well, that's all going to yeah. take time away from soccer. Yes. You can't, you right. know, we need to, we need to keep this. <laughs> yes, I know. Well, I mean, I guess I, I think, you know, my advice to parents is to have like four basic principles, like keep your family close, you know, this is your family. And I think when most parents, they go into it with the right motives, they want their children to be happy. They want them to develop sports are good for you. And that's great. There are also these factors at work pulling your family apart. And this travel stuff at young ages just disrupts the family. So my advice is to start later. You know, don't do, you don't need to do the organized stuff when they're five years old. Like encourage just play, even if they don't want to do any of this stuff, just let them play. Sports aren't organized sports. It's not the only way to get exercise, you know, (laughs) go out and and I know everyone's like, oh, they'll just want to be on their phone and watch TV and all that. It's like, well, you can do something about that. With, yeah. There's, It's not like either organized soccer or they're on their phone every day, every moment. You know, right. you can, like everything else, you don't want to close that question of yes, no. You exactly. want it to be, okay, here's, or, and and you can even throw it out to them. It's like, hey, you could try to learn how to roller rollerblade and, and, you know, go that route. You could ride a bike. You can, yeah, we can play wiffle ball in the backyard. We, there are different things There's a, like that and a lot of options you know that are are short of you know doing organized sports when they're young I, I think the longer you can delay that stuff the better because also it keeps it it keeps it their thing and it's it's they're driving it if, if they are the ones outside playing and whatever whether it's capture capture the flag or tag or wiffle ball whatever it is you know it's it's they're the ones driving it and it's out of fun. So I, you know, I, I really encourage parents to delay the organized stuff as long as possible, stay local as long as possible. And if you do go into the travel stuff, just, and, and many will, of course, to put some boundaries around it, you know, say no to some of the stuff. You don't have to do everything. You just, and I guess there may be repercussions. There may be consequences. We had this in my family when my son was young and on a travel soccer team. He was like fourth grade, maybe fifth. And they insisted on playing two seasons, which you well know, fall and spring. And it's like, oh, but wait a minute. Spring is baseball season. So we said, well, he's just not going to, he's not going to do the soccer in the spring. He'll, you know, we'll sign up. But we're like, sorry, no, thanks. Well, the next year, then he was demoted to the soccer team. It's like, you know, That's from their point of view, look, you didn't agree, you didn't abide by our terms. So I get it from their point of view. And I think my feeling about it then was, oh, well, it's, it's just not that big a deal. It's just not that important. It is more important that 
he have a breadth of athletic experience that we don't feel beholden to the dumb rules or the dumb regulations that are counter to his well-being and our family unit. So, oh, well, the consequences will take it, you know? Right. I think there has to be a little bit of willingness to say, well, we're going to pay that price. It's just, And it's not that high a price. Well, that's that, right, right. Uh, fear of missing out. Is that that that's pretty much what it sounds like to me. But to your point also, yeah, about playing organized sports, delay it as possible. I agree with that 100 percent. We never had trainers and lessons and hitting instructors and pitching we never had that we went out in the street and we played baseball that's how we became better athletes by doing it ourselves yeah yeah well and again it the more adults are like pulling the strings the less kids like it it's just not as much fun so that's why i also think if you delay the organized stuff for as long as possible you know by the time kids get to high school I mean, there's no guarantee, obviously, that they're going to make the team. But a lot of those kids who were playing and, you know, out there in their uniforms and getting their special instruction, they will be sick and tired of it. As you well, you all know this. They're going to be sick and tired of it. They're going to maybe they're hurt. They need Tommy John surgery. You know, you just got to play the long game, I think, as a parent. And that's really hard because... Nobody knows what they're doing, which I fully appreciate. But if you can just kind of keep these main, these principles in mind, like what's, what are we doing here? Why are we doing this? And is this necessary and important? If you can kind of keep those principles in mind, you'll be less off, less apt to have a, you know, a 14 year old who's like burned out on sports, I think. That was that was the term I was I was thinking as soon as you were leading up to that was like is getting burnt and we've we've certainly seen it Jimmy and I have definitely seen it it's it's something we belong to multiple groups on Facebook and Twitter where we talk about these topics it's not it's not a regional thing it's it's this is universal across the country probably across the world at this point uh, mm-hmm. but it, where yeah they get so much fostered on them and if they're doing they're, you know, God forbid they actually are playing to trying to play two sports because they enjoy two sports. And mm-hmm. now you've got these conflicts and especially in the spring and the fall where, um, you know, you've got so many conflicts going on and then, oh, by the way, you also still have like homework and you also still <laughs> have actually socializing with friends and, and, and doing things like that and doing chores around the house. I don't know if Kenny yeah. kids do chores anymore, but, yeah. um, you know, that type of stuff. Yeah. It, it's, Again, finite hours in the day. Mm-hmm. We they can't all be if they're all filled. That's not healthy. It's not healthy for people our age. It's not healthy for a thirteen-year-old. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know the point about chores and stuff too. I think you know. I think many parents think, and I know my my parents did that. Sports build character. You know, you're out there. You're getting developing discipline and responsibility, and how to work with others and be respectful of the coach and all that. And yet, when the nature of it is okay, kids, sorry, there's no time to do anything. (laughs) You don't have time to make your bed. There's no time to pick up after yourself. There's no time to help at home because we got to get you to your game or your practice where you're going to learn these important skills. It's so <laughs> ironic and so absurd because they could learn that at home. Right. We're depriving of them of like a natural opportunity to like be responsible and, you know, depositing them in this other place where they're supposed to pick it up. It just, it's nonsensical. That's, that's funny. You just, you just jumped right into my next topic that I wanted to discuss was about character because Yes, I believe that sports do certain things nowadays because the the kids aren't learning it any any other place, but it it also depends on the coach and it also depends on where they're playing, like dealing with adversity because they don't know how to. They're they're Mm -hmm. so used to getting their own way and having everything be rosy for them. It's okay if things don't go right. Let's just put it behind us and let's just move on to the next the the next play Mm -hmm. so yeah there's a lot to be said about character to your point being 
being built up in the right places mm -hmm. and not relying on some coach that you don't you may or may not know when you think he's going to teach a kid character no that's a yeah. parent's role yeah we can't be the main driver of your kids personality traits and characteristics we can enforce the things Re that you're right, reinforcing teaching at it, yes. home that's yeah. how, that's you know we we can supplement it by reinforcing the same types of things but if we're the main driver and then they're not getting it at home it's the same thing we, we talked about the last show with uh, a hitting lesson and then not working on it on your own time if that hour is the only you know the only time that you're getting it you're not becoming a better hitter same thing with character stuff obviously if they get home and and it's all just kid can mouth off to the parents whenever they want and the parents are complaining about teachers and coaches and all this stuff the yeah. kids hear that and they think yeah. that it that that's normal that's and okay yeah well i know what i was going to say was about adversity and you know I, I think one of the great wonderful thing about sports is that it's this little laboratory for this whole range of experiences and feelings, you know, there's humiliation, there's jubilation, delight, joy, friendship, but there's also, you know, this loss, defeat, sadness. And that's what makes sports so great because as a kid going through this, you learn that, okay, tomorrow's another day for better or worse. You have a great day, you're the top of the world. The next day, nobody cares. You know, you have a terrible day. You think you're the biggest loser on the planet. And then you have another game and it's all gone. And I think that's what is so valuable about sports for kids. And so when we kind of whitewash the adversity, like we need to overcome this, we need to like switch teams or get a better coach. So there is no adversity. That's like completely ruining the whole point one of the right. most important benefits of sports is this adversity you're talking about. Like, it's okay. We'll get up tomorrow and we'll face another day. Yeah. I mean, teaching them how to fight through that adversity and how to handle it is a big part of what we do, but yeah. it's a difficult thing to do nowadays. I mean, I, I literally go through a failure protocol with my mm -hmm. players. You mean like a one of those PCA things, like flush the bad thing that happened? They have a, you know, like exactly a, a protocol like that to kind of move on, help you the kids move out of this like mistake or whatever. Yeah, that is that like that's a really useful thing for a coach to know and for kids to learn. Sure, sure. And it's not something I'm going to go and say anybody's doing. You know, no. Okay, when I say anybody, obviously you're talking about one, maybe one percent. Are, are doing something like that. No coaches really go through that at the youth level. You know, yeah. there might be ones that are doing it more advanced, but you know, you, you need to work on that right from day one. If you, if you see these kids at six, seven and they're, you know, this is the whole thing where like, okay, maybe they don't need to be doing the organized sports, but they are. So, all right, let's make the best of this situation and figure out the, 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 the foundation that we can lay here, not just that from the physical aspect, but the mental aspect mm -hmm. that really can help yeah. to build throughout their their life so what let me ask you guys about solutions like do you think that having better coach education i mean that's kind of is that one of the solutions that we can all yeah. agree on the first i think it was the first show or one of the first shows we did and we've been doing this for a year and a half year and three quarters now was coaching the coaches mm -hmm. that was that was the first that was one of the main topics that jimmy and i would just we would talk about and i said let's you know, let's build a show around that. Basically, it was about youth development. Well, it starts with who's developing, who's developing the players. Yeah. And what do they know? Yeah. And it's not just about the mechanical aspect of coaching them. It's, yeah. it's the whole package. And um, so, yeah, so it, it starts with coaches knowing what they're doing, not just how to run the, the game, but how to really run a team of youth players. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. The coach is the one that sets the culture. He sets the tone by teaching coaches that you have to set the tone. So if you have a coach that's in the dugout yelling and screaming constantly and doing all of that stuff, then man, you have your kid in the wrong place because that's not what the coach should be doing. He should be mm -hmm. setting the example. Yeah. And the more we educate coaches and make them understand 
that this is your ship. You're running a ship. However you run it, that's what you're going to get out of it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I don't think that enough amateur and youth coaches take the time to do what's necessary to be able to help their players the right way. Yeah. Well, and, you know, and of course the leagues are going to say, it's hard enough getting coaches. We can't, you know, we can't impose one more thing on them, but I, one more requirement, you know, and, and I right. get that too. I, I, I do understand, you know, like there's a lot of factors at play here, but I think if I were the parent, I would, you know, would you rather have a coach who is doing what you're describing, screaming and yelling and being a maniac in the dugout? Or would you, is that better than having, you know, your kids just go outside and play with them, you know, or go to a rec team or something like where the coaches know what they're doing, at least insofar as they're not going to make kids hate it. Like, right. I mean, you know, it seems in, like you were better off without that coach entirely. Yes. Right. In, in what other aspect of life would that be a good situation? Would that be a good situation? <laughs> there's there's yeah. none. Well, yeah. so that fields over to here as well. It's still not good. Okay. So let me ask you guys, what do you think? Why do we tolerate it in sports and not anywhere else? Do you have any theories on that? The yelling and screaming, the berating, the humiliating, you know, just like, why is that okay in sports? Because I I think that people equate that with trying to win. Mm -hmm. They think that you're aggressive, you're fighting, you're doing this, you're doing that to try and win. I want to train my players so that when they're on the field, they're performing the best that they can they can be and that will translate into winning the game not because i was in the dugout screaming and yelling and barking at the umpire because some mistake that he made do you think really changed the outcome of this game yeah it had <laughs> nothing to do with it i know i know or more importantly did it change the outcome of will it change the outcome of this kid's life yeah right you know no <laughs> i i think there's a lot less of it that's allowed other than Unfortunately, when those coaches have success, yes, then the parent who maybe doesn't know better thinks that that's a that's a good way to do things. Yeah, you know, you know, it well, it works. So let's yeah. so let's go with it. Not not maybe fully understanding that there's ten other ways you could do this, and the team's if the team's talented, the team's talented. Mm-hmm. It's, yeah, the team's not talented because the coach is a maniac. Yeah, right. <laughs> It's, it's probably in right. spite of the fact that the coach well right there. exactly right how much better how much how much better would some of the more mild kids the more mild mannered kids the shire yeah. kids be if they didn't have this overbearing how many more how many of those kids wouldn't have quit yeah you know the, the the kid you know the kid that's number one or number two on the team we're not so worried about them quitting most of the time it's the seventh eighth ninth best kid on the team yeah who maybe is splitting time and whatnot those are the ones that typically quit because of how they're a lot of times it's how they're treated yeah Um, yeah right but see i have a theory that one reason we allow it in sports or, or look the other way is because especially in middle and upper income areas where parents worry about spoiling their kids that's like uh well the coach is tough on them. It's like a little reality some, check. Some discipline. Yeah. So, and like, you know, a little school of hard knocks, you know, that they're not getting it anywhere else. So it's probably good for them, you know, to have them be yelled at or treated a certain way or treated sort of harshly because they're not treated. It's a reality check on all the easy stuff they've had. I, I have the suspicion that that's part of it. <laughs> it, it could be, but there's, there's also a way to do that. And, and the reason why I'm saying this is I will bark at my players. I, my language is horrible when I'm on the field. And if I get on a player, I'm getting on him because it was something that I want to hammer home. So I want to make sure he understands the severity of it. But I can't be a hypocrite and say that yelling is, is and, and being loud is is bad because I think it has its place. Mm -hmm. So I guess I would say maybe it goes back to the education. There's a way to do it. And Mm -hmm. I can be tough at times, but we can also go on the field at times and for a two, three hour practice laugh the whole time. But don't you think there's a difference between being tough and being mean? 
Oh yeah. Oh, absolutely. You can be tough and be have high expectations without being a jerk. You know, right. I think that's to me, that's Jimmy likes to gym. do both. <laughs> Well, wait a minute. And, and this, but when I'm a jerk, it's usually not on the baseball field. <laughs> that's 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 true. No, and and it's something that you know, something Jimmy and I talk about, where he kind of the self depreciating um, uh, messages that he puts out sometimes. Jimmy, you, you, as much as you talk about being tough and yelling at the kids, I know, I know you're not what we see in some of these videos. Okay, no. and that's where I, you know, I, so you're 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 painting a, I think you're painting a worse picture of yourself than, than the reality. And, and nobody's saying that coaches can't be tough. We have to be tough. That is in our job description is to try to get the kids to be as good as they can. And you can only do so much of that by asking nicely, mm -hmm. you know, there is a time where you have to do it. You're not screaming it at a kid because he let a ball go through his legs. You're not oh, screaming never. at, you're not screaming at a kid because he overthrew first base, never. which we do see. We oh, see yeah. that kind of stuff out there. Of course. There. Yeah. Okay. Or, you know, so again, I, I, I think context has some role here, uh, has a big role here. Mm -hmm. well, see, I have to say, I think I'm not, I do believe that being, you can be tough and be demanding and without being mean. I'm, I'm a little unsure about where I stand on the yelling because I, I always think of this advice that was my dog trainer gave us. Uh, years and years ago, he said, you, he said, don't yell at your dog. She's not responding because she's not listening. In other words, she can hear you just fine when you say stop or sit. If she's not doing it, it's not because she can't hear you. It's because she's not listening. And I think the same is true of players. And, you know, you're, you're, it, it's not because they can't hear you. They just aren't listening. Well, to be fair, most dogs are smarter than a lot of our players. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is a German Shepherd, so you know she was smart. Oh, very <laughs> smart. Very smart. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. But I mean, I, mean, I wouldn't, and, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I guess really what it is is what, 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 what I do, I, I wouldn't call it yelling because I'm not, even though my voice is elevated and I would really term it, and I, I use this term all the time, is that I'm really barking at a player. Yeah. Um, it's like you said, I'm not being mean. I'm not you dumb this, that, and the other, you know, yeah. I can't, you're, no, 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 no. I understand yeah. it's difficult for you, but let's work yeah. through it. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Well, it's constructive. Right. And we're not yelling at the first instance of, of things typically either. It's like you said, it's like, okay, now here's how this is what we have to, okay. Well, after the third or fourth time, now as a coach, you've got your, You've got your options. Okay. I need to change. I need, if, if the player is not changing, then I need to change. So that yes. might mean getting tougher and getting louder. It might mean for some coaches, it might mean giving up on the player. And that's yeah. something I know Jimmy won't do. It's not in Never. his DNA. Yeah. So that's where that kind of comes into play. And, and I think, I think I'm in the same vein. I like to think I am mm -hmm. in terms of my self-reflection on that stuff, because on my dynamic with my head coach, I'm definitely more of the, I don't want to say disciplinarian. He's, he's not a pushover by any means, but I'm definitely more likely to get loud, to start saying, what, what are we doing? What are we doing? And why are we doing it this way? And again, it might just be, he's used to, he's been a teacher of fifth graders and sixth graders. He, <laughs> so he, he versus I've dealt with quasi adults for my professional career. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, you know, there's, so there's a difference there in mentality. Well, it might also be a little bit of good cop, bad cop kind of thing. You know, different approaches can motivate kids in different ways. Yeah, I'm good at being the ass. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I also think it comes down to we had Butch Chaffin on, and I'm sure you're not familiar, but he is the varsity high school coach in Cookville, Tennessee. He's a very well-respected high school coach, very involved with USA Baseball, just a very, very smart baseball guy. Mm -hmm. And I love the way he put this. He said, when I get on you, he said, I'm getting on Johnny, the player. I'm not getting on Johnny, the person. Mm -hmm. He said, but, and because he's, he's a, a, a teacher in the school, he said, you get a bad grade on your algebra, uh, in your algebra class, 
He said, now I'm getting on Johnny the person because that's what really matters. And I'm going to I'm going to get on you because you have to do better. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I like the way he explained that, because that's really to me, it made sense. Well, it's, it's also underscoring what's priorities. You know, what you should right. really be focused on is your schoolwork. And they are ultimately, I think we all know they're complementary sports and academics. You know, the athletes yes. tend to do well, but it's, it's refreshing when a coach will encourage that over, you know, necessarily oh, I, I, fixating on the sport. Oh, believe me, that's the first thing that I hammer home and I'm sure Dave does also. Yeah. I don't want to hear about your sports until I know your your academics are in order. You can't mm -hmm. play baseball until your grades are right. Yeah, that's that's great, you know. Yeah. But about the yelling and screaming again, I guess what I would like to see with more coaches is instead of blowing up at the team when they don't do well, say Ooh. when they lose or whatever, <clears throat> How about, you know, you take a look in the mirror and see well, what are, what did I do wrong? I feel like there's not enough reflection on what's my responsibility here and this team's this team's whatever lack of performance or underperformance, whatever it is, you know, if I actually consider myself the head, the leader here, then I better take responsibility for what's happening, you know, that maybe I need to do things differently instead of screaming at them for blowing something okay well maybe you didn't you know practice that enough or maybe you know, whatever there's all kinds of things that coaches do wrong and I think there needs to be a little more reflection absolutely I mean that's it's, it's got to start it's got to start from there you know how did we do and, and it can go to a big picture of how did we do our winter workouts maybe we focused on the wrong things during that right, and then going right. forward to even yesterday's practice all right if I I knew that this was a problem and I didn't I didn't set up practice. The kids don't run the practice. We run the practice. So mm -hmm. if we've been doing, if we've been making this mistake, whether it be a mental or physical thing, and we don't work on it in the next practice, that's a hundred percent on me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We, we just had, we just had that little story that I told in the last episode about a kid that was swinging when I gave the steel sign and I, Dave and I were having a conversation and I said, I said, whose fault is that? I said, that mm -hmm. fault, it's mine. That's mm -hmm. not that kid's fault. I didn't do a good enough job hammering that home to him. So now I got to work on it harder because I want to yeah. make sure he gets it. That's my yeah. fault. Yeah. But I, th I think that the instinct is for coaches to screw when there's embarrassing, maybe it's like, Oh God, they did this dumb thing and you feel stupid as the coach. And so the, in your instinct is to get mad, you know? And I think that's so it's just destructive. It's not the right, you might feel it, but you can't act on it because it's not helping. Well, that, that's something that I wanted to bring up because I know we're running out of time, but I think it's important to address because you just hit something that that I wanted to bring up during this conversation about being embarrassed. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of the issues that happen with parents are because they get embarrassed. And mm -hmm. then what happens is the anger builds up. You know, their, their, their child is out on the field. He made three errors and he struck out looking three times. Okay. As a coach, I understand. All right. The kid had a bad day. All right, buddy. It's my, my responsibility to build that kid up in that situation. You don't want to mm -hmm. beat him up. He just had a bad day, mm -hmm. but the parent is embarrassed. So now they're lashing out at the coach and they're lashing out at the umpire and they're lashing out at the guy who's selling hot dogs in the concession yeah. stand. Yeah. <clears throat> That's where a lot of it That's comes it. from. I totally agree. Yeah. It's like this it's public. It feels like a public humiliation, you know? Yeah. And I have to say just an example of what was a perfect example of the way a parent handled this same situation years ago, this, their son was on the mound. He was probably 10 years old, maybe 11. And he walked he kept walking these players like one after another, they like went around the bases. It was, and those parents, they just sat there and they didn't say a word. And, you know, meanwhile, my son was on the team, same team that the pitcher was on. And I was like, oh God, you know, got to move, change that pitcher. Of course I didn't say that, but you know, that's the way you're feeling. But I thought, I thought their restraint was so commendable that they said not a word. And I'm sure they were dying inside and they didn't say a peep to the coaches or to their son, or if anything, it was like supportive. And it takes a lot of restraint because it is okay. embarrassing. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and not to be a one upper on that story, Linda, but just imagine <laughs> Jimmy and I have been in the position where we've 
been the coach of that kid <laughs> and having and being in that situation You're just trying to keep and, your mouth shut yeah yeah that's you talk about a tough you know tough tough uh thing to handle as a coach of balancing that out of wanting to wanting to to you know sometimes wanting to yell at the kid wanting to hug the kid wanting to, you, know, you have this whole yes. swirling of emotions yes. going it's on a stew of feelings and then yeah. being the one to walk out to the mound and take the ball from, from him because, <laughs> oh. because it, it was time so yeah that's that's um that's well, one of the some of the toughest things we've had uh, it is. As, as coaches definitely but again it's that embarrassed it's but it, it's the adult's again, our feelings that kind of shape things, whether right. it's the coach, your embarrassment or the parents is the embarrassment. It's not, it's, it's, we need to separate ourselves from that and have the restraint and say, this is their experience. And yes, okay, I'm uncomfortable, but kind of try to live with it and not freak out. Blow well, up at everybody. We're supposed to be the adult in the room. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's, it's a weird concept as the adult, we're supposed to be the adult and act like it. Yeah. And, um, yeah, that's unfortunately, that's something that has definitely been lost yeah. and, uh, tough, tough thinking as that gets worse and worse, what the next generation is going to look like with, uh, with how they handle these things. So, yeah. but I, on that note, I think it's a, a good time to bring, bring us back to, uh, we're on the line with Linda Flanagan, uh, author, of take back the game. The catch line is how money and mania are ruining kids sports and why it matters. I think we all know that it matters and it's, it's a pretty severe issue going on right now. So I, I really want to thank you for taking the time with us today, Linda. I know everybody's time is valuable. Why don't you let our listeners know where can we find the book and where can we get in touch with you? Well, the book is available where at all bookstores on Amazon, you know, you can get it basically anywhere. It's widely available. And certainly follow me on Twitter. I'm at Linda Flanagan too. That's number two. I'm going to have a website up imminently, I promise. And I've written a lot of articles and things for the Atlantic and my email is attached to all those. So I'm always happy to be in touch with, with anyone. All right, great. Well, thanks. And definitely let us know when the website's up, we'll promote it on our show. Uh, and in and, and our social medias. And uh, again, I just I really want to thank you for taking the time to sit with us today. I think it was a very, very important conversation, different direction than what we we go on the show quite a bit, but I think it was very, very important. Well, well thank you. It was my pleasure to be here. Nice chatting with both of you guys. I really, really appreciate you coming on, Linda. I mean, I think it was, you know, to echo what Dave said, I think it was a great conversation. And I'd love to leave the door open to have you back if you'd like to come back, because I think we only scratched the surface. I think there's so much more that we could discuss. And yeah, we'll keep that door open. I'd be happy to come back. It was fun. Nice talking to you guys. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Linda. And there we have it. Our conversation with Linda Flanagan, author, Take Back the Game, How Money and Mania Are Ruining Kids Sports and Why It Matters. Uh, I, I think it was very interesting. I hope, I know it was a little di- different direction than we typically go with the show in terms of the type of guests that we had on, but uh, I, I hope our listeners really found it interesting and helpful. I know I did. I think that it was a great conversation. And I also believe that there's a lot of stuff there that that we could have probably got into, but due to time constraints, we couldn't. So, I mean, I, I'll be honest with you, Dave, I, I would, I wouldn't mind having her back again. I think it would be another great show. Yeah, I think it's, a, I think it's a good idea. Uh, again, it's the type of thing we do talk about these topics quite frequently. It's nice to get a, a, a different point of view from somebody. Well, she did coach for uh, quite a long time, as she said. But it's also the first time that we've had a woman's point of view on the show. So I think that there's certainly something to be said for getting that because we talk about parents a lot. And obviously, I I think most of what we talk about is probably the the, the fathers uh, or the, you know, the, the male that's that's involved, father, stepfather, grandfather, whoever that's involved, they tend to be historically more vocal, although you know, looking at my video feeds these days, <laughs> moms right. are getting pretty aggressive too. So, uh, you know, a little, little bit different take and yeah, there's, there's definitely a lot more to, to go into there. Yeah. And I, I think the fact that she's a former athlete, she's a coach, she's 
like you said, involved with the PCA. There is, you know, her perspective was was really interesting to me because she's really coming from the same background kind of that, that we're coming from. And her perspective wasn't really different than the way we see it. Yeah, for the for the most part. Um, I don't know if I agree with not getting the kids involved in organized sports at an early age. I agree we shouldn't be pushing them to a high level at early age, but I, I think there's still a lot of good things that come out of starting up with, with teams uh, fairly early. I think that, again, I like to think of it as a reinforcement of things that we talk about at home. And also keep in mind, there's a lot of kids, because they don't get that at home, that might be the only place that they, that they get that type of attention and that type of discipline, even if it's done, and I'm not talking about the screamer, even if it's done in every team has to have some, has to have discipline on it. So, so yeah, so I, I, I think I would probably disagree with her. That's something maybe we could get into down the line with her a little bit more on, on that, but, but overall, uh, yeah, certainly agree with most of what she said. And um, again, I, I hope our listeners really found it both interesting and entertaining. Yeah, and I, I think they will. I enjoyed it. Good. And that's what's most important. So uh, we <laughs> so just um, want to thank everybody for tuning in. Please remember to subscribe, rate, and review the show, whether it be on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to us. Also, tell a friend, tell a neighbor, tell somebody you don't like very much. Let's get the, uh, the word of the show going. And so we can keep growing. Our, our numbers do keep going up, and that's great. We want to get it to a point where, obviously, this is, uh, this is something where we get the enjoyment, not out of, obviously, just speaking to each other and the guests that we have, but knowing that we are having some impact on, on your lives is a, is a great feeling for us. So make sure that you're doing that. Leave us a review. Go ahead and reach out to us at the CTB show on Twitter. You can follow us on Facebook under both of our names individually, plus clearing the basis podcast on Facebook and then also on Twitter. And yeah, let us know. Reach out to us, uh, clearing the bases at gmail.com. Give us an idea of what you're looking for in future shows. If this one doesn't suit your fancy, let us know what you're looking for. And also, we're looking at doing a kind of a Q&A show coming up. So go ahead and throw us your cues, and we'll give you some A's. Please go ahead. And I know that was awkward, but um, <laughs> I liked it. Yeah, I liked it, too. We will get back to you, whether it be actually typing something out or we'll mention you on the show, uh, mention your question on the show. We won't call you out for it, uh, even if it's something that, that we disagree with. Uh, we like to have a debate on here. Obviously, I think you guys know at this point, we're, we're easy to talk to. So reach out to us. We look forward to hearing from you. Always remember, the only two things we have control in this life are our effort and our attitude. Give us 100% effort, positive mental attitude, PMA, and great things will follow. Final thoughts, coach? So I would urge everybody to go out and get a copy of Linda's book. It's called Take Back the Game, How Money and Mania Are Ruining Kids' Sports and Why It Matters. I think it's pretty interesting, the, the conversation that we had. And I think if, if you pick up a copy of her book and read it, I think you'll find that interesting, too. And one of the other things that I, I think is that I really believe that Linda understands people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. Thanks, everyone, and we'll see you on the next one. Thank you.